يقدم اللعب نعم انت مخلينا فقط ثلاثة ايام بعد دراسة اللعب ما نفترض يكون اسبوع لا عادي ثلاثة ايام كافي عندك تروحني يعني ما انا صراحة ما شفت ما حسبت الحساب يعني على بالي انه راح يكون تسليمه قبل بيوم قبل اللعب الثاني يعني في العادي يعطونا اسبوع فالحين تفاجئت دخلت شفت انه خلاص مخلص الوقت التسليم زين ما عليه ارسل لي اياه عادي خبرني السبب لكن اتوقع ان اسبوع كافي تعرف ايش اللي صار فصل الماضي كنت اعطيهم حتى اسبوع عن الثلاث اسابيع مع ذلك الطلبه كانوا يسلموا اخر وقت وفي منهم ما كانوا يسلموا في منهم كنت اتواصل معاهم لين نهايه بعد ما الاختبار الفاينل خلص كنت اتواصل معاهم نفسي يا جماعه اعطوني اللعبة على الاقل اعطيكم درجه درجتين دار صفر بعدهم في منهم ما سلموا فما العاده يعني اسبوع كامل فعاد اللي يمضي فوق الاسبوع يعني قبل بدايه اللعب الثاني عاد هنا يكون صح يعني في العاده هو اسبوع طيب خلاص من اللعب القادم نخلي اسبوع بس ما نزيد اكثر طيب يعني ماشي اشكال يا دكتور اذا سلمنا تو تاخير آه لم من اللعب القادم بيكون اسبوع هذا انت هذا اللعب انت ما عنده مشكله يا الله أحسن دكتور ما قصرت طيب من اللعب القادم نخلي اسبوع So let's start where we stopped. First of all, uh, please pray for my daughter. She's still in the uh, in hospital since Friday early morning. She was contracted with COVID-19 as well. Um, so let's start we were, where we stopped last time because I believe there are a few slides left uh, regarding the seismic refraction technique. Uh, during the next lab, the one we will have this week, we'll use a software rather than manually picking. Software will help us to pick much easier, more confidently, get better results, and be assured that the model is correct. The final model is correct. Uh, instead of one shot, you will get more than one shot. So during the last lab, you uh, might have guessed or experienced that there is only one shot whereas for the lab you will be the next lab the one you will be doing using a software package the number of shots are much more than one however um, the software itself can help you to pick the early uh, uh, the, the first arrivals or what we call also early arrivals Thus, picking is much easier. You can easily modify the picks if you find that uh, one of the shots is totally different. The time arrivals of one shot is totally different than the other shots. It means that either you made something wrong with the shot, once you made the shot during field deposition, or you're picking the way you picked the first arrival is wrong. The one common uh, thing you physicist usually notice in their, career, in their career as a, as a professional geophysicist once they join an oil company is that picking is always there. You will all the time you'll have something to pick. In the first arrival, um, some horizon of interest, the one which you believe is probably a reservoir, picking is always the, there. Sometimes we also pick velocities uh, in uh, some other advanced courses. So one technique which is quite fascinating, which is the new trend, is that we use artificial intelligence. We use advanced techniques. Instead of manual picking, we use some new advanced technique. Let the computer guess the right picking position, where to pick the first arrival or other types of energy not necessarily the first P wave, probably even later arrivals. So AI techniques is the trend in geophysics. Many articles now, right now or the last two or three years um, are dedicated to use of artificial intelligence 
in geophysical applications. Back to our topics. So the last time I believe I stopped here. So we discussed how to find out the velocities and the number of layers along with their thicknesses if we have multiple layers and those layers are horizontal. There is no DP. That's an easier thing. We discussed the equations, how the equation gets complicated if the number of layers is more than, or the number of layers are more than two or three or five. The complication is that the equation becomes, the equation of intercept time becomes longer and longer. Whereas the velocity is simply how, the, simp the simplest way is to uh, find out the, the slope of the lines, how many lines are there. Uh, that's how you determine the velocities. One of the, the trickiest part is how many layers are there? How many layers should I interpret? It's a bit really not easy task. For example, if I make some drawing here, let's show that this is a geophone here and here started the first break. Uh, this is another geophone, third geophone. So these are related probably to this layer, layer three. And there are other three here. So to determine, are there one layer or two different layers? That's really tricky. That's not an easy thing to do. And this is one of the reasons we will discuss later on that uh, makes the seismic refraction technique have some cones, some drawbacks compared to, for example, seismic reflection technique. So going forward, making things a bit more complicated, what about dipping layers? What if the layers are dipping? We'll start with a simple case, two layer case only, two layers, first layer and second layer, and see, see how things get complicated if there is a dipping in the subsurface layers. For dipping, if there is a dipping, it cannot be determined using only one shot. We can't determine whether there is a dipping or not based only on one shot. We need to make an extra effort and make another shot. So we'll make two shots instead of one. We assume that the geophones in this diagram are lie down on the surface in this transect, and we have one shot hammered here, we call it forward, that's the forward shot. And we make another shot, call it reverse shot. So what are the interesting, interesting things we'll find on the data sets, the geophysical data we get? If we make then the picking for these first arrival picking for the forward and uh, reverse shots and draw the, the line connecting those points, the first arrivals, the interesting thing we'll find is that the direct have the same slope because the energy whether you shoot forward or reverse for the direct, the energy is traveling in the first layer directly from the source to any receiver. We assume that there is a receiver here, another receiver or a geophone. The energy goes directly. So whether you shoot reverse or forward, the slope is the same. However, for the refraction, the case is different. We will get two different slope. We'll get a different slope for the forward and reverse shots. And thus, we don't call them the true velocities. We call them apparent. They are not the two representing velocities of the subsurface. We call them apparent. That's what we calculate from seismic data. That's what we see. But whether it's the correct velocity of the subsurface or not, that's something we need to approve. 
we need to check, we need to validate. We could bring other data. One of the good data, solid data, is will logs, will data. However, if we don't have will data, then it's a guess. It's an apparent velocity. It's not the true velocity of the subsurface. I'm talking about the refraction, the refraction energy. So we shoot forward and reverse. We make two shoot, two different shoots to determine whether the layers are dipping or not. And we can confirm if they are dipping or not by investigating or calculating the slopes from the refracted energy. We'll find that the slopes of the forward and reverse are no longer the same. They are different. The conclusion we make then is that there is a dipping. And one of the interesting thing uh, one can find is that, I go one step backward, the slope is different. Which slope is actually faster? Which slope is gentler? Is it going down deep? That's once we go down deep. This is once we go up deep. This is going up deep. That's how we go down deep. So that's the thing we will find out. For the time being, think about it. Which one you think has a higher velocity? The forward shot or the reverse? The refraction from the forward or from the reverse? To get an average velocity, which one is the right velocity? You, you should give a, a final interpretation to the geologist. The geologist asks you about one velocity of the subsurface. So what's the correct velocity of the second layer in this schematic diagram, where the model is made up of two layers? What is the velocity of the second layer? One simple, simple way is to calculate the average, take the average. So the velocity of the second layer is the average of the two, from the one you obtain from forward, and the one you obtain from the reverse. But the dip will be different in both sides because the intercept time is different. And that implies what? That tells you what? It tells you that the, the, there is a difference in thickness because the layer is dipping. One, at one side, the thickness is lower than the other side. I go back, so this intercept is lower than this intercept. Insert the intercept from the forward is lower than the intercept from reverse. That's down dip, whereas this is up dip. That's how we move up the direction, I'm moving up the direction, according to the model I have. So the intercept time here is different. I get a lower thickness. Here I get a larger thickness. For the reverse shot, I get a larger thickness. And the thickness can be calculated following those equations. This is the equation you can use to get the thickness. You just need to have the velocities and the intercept time. That's the intercept time. So the observations are what? Uh, we get two different velocities. The slope are different for forward and reverse. And the thicknesses for both of these shots is as well different. So which, usually which side gives you a higher velocity? Is it the forward or the reverse? But before jumping to this conclusion, what do you think about the interface, what do you think about the thickness? What kind of thickness is that? The thickness is not the vertical thickness, it's the thickness perpendicular to the layer. I haven't discussed that before, but the thickness, the H value is this value, the perpendicular to the interface, that's the thickness, not the vertical thickness. That's the vertical thickness. It's almost the stratigraphic thickness. So when we talk in, 
in geologic manner or geologic uh, terminology, there are two different thicknesses. One is the if the layer, for example, is dipping, let's assume that this is a dipping layer. This is this is the vertical thickness, whereas this one is the stratigraphic thickness. So which thickness is larger, you think? The stratigraphic thickness or the vertical thickness? The vertical. The vertical. The vertical. For certainty, the vertical is larger than the stratigraphic thickness. And that the same applies as well here. So this edge usually is thinner than the vertical thickness. And that's fine. You know, some geologists are more interested actually on the stratigraphic thickness than the vertical thickness. If we talk about oil water contact, then we might be interested on the vertical thickness rather than the stratigraphic thickness. However, for mining interest, if you are doing mining and you want to know how much is the thickness of uh, some uh, some layer uh, which have let's assume gold mines or gold pools, then we might be interested on uh, stratigraphic thickness. So I repeat, for over water contacts, we might be interested on the vertical thickness. However, for mining, we are trying to find an ore body, um, some minerals, for example, uh, metal ore bodies or other types of ore bodies, strati stratigraphic thicknesses are of much more interest than vertical thicknesses. So which slopes is larger? Which direction you get a higher velocity? If you shoot down deep, that's a down deep direction. I'm shooting down deep. You get a lower velocity. The slope, the line, or the slope of the lines, the refracted lines are steeper. They are very steep. So this one is steeper than this one. This line, this refraction is steeper than the other one. This is gentler. It has a higher velocity than this one. Let's assume this is one, this is two. Two is from forward. One is from reverse shot. Reverse shot is doing up dip. So the slope is gentler. So the velocity we get from reverse is higher than the slope or the velocity we get from forward. Uh, just a minute. Uh, so we have, this is the cleaners. <laughs> they interrupt me a lot. I lock the door, they keep knocking, knocking, knocking. On. And they see me, I'm not sure why they still keep knocking. So let's raise everything. Uh, so question here, how we determine the real dip? What is the dip? How we can find it? What's the equations we can use? And another interesting thing, if I assume this is, this is a book, let's assume that this is a layer, an interface. If it's dipping like that, that's the deep direction, it's dipping in that direction. Whereas my shot line, my geophones are planted not, not along the deep direction, but at angle, some angle on this plan. So I made two shots, one, one in each end of this pen. So I assume that there are a lot of geophones. This is the interface. One of them is the forward, the other one is the reverse shot. So the dip you get from such configuration is not the true dip. It's also an apparent dip. You will get the true dip only if your geophones are aligned along the dip direction. However, we don't know actually how the geology is dipping underneath. Who knows? Unless if we make a lot of uh, drills, a lot of wheels. But in general, common sense, we don't know how the layers are dipping. We might plant 
our geophones in a line, a straight line, in any direction. So if you make, my question, if I make my geophone line perpendicular, exactly perpendicular to the dip direction, that's the dip direction, I make my geophones perpendicular. I shoot one shot at the far end, this is forward, and the other one is reverse. Would I get any difference in velocities of the refraction, refraction from forward and reverse? No. Yeah, that's true. No. Because there is no dipping. In this direction, there is no dipping. You won't get any difference. There is no difference between these two. One and two. They will have the same slope. So I cannot determine the velocity. Looks like there is a lag. Uh, the lag because <laughs> you are responding back after like some time. You get the two dip if your line of geophones is parallel to the dip direction. But we usually don't know which one is the dip direction, how the layers are dipping. We can orient our geophones in any orientation. So that's another difficulty. My question again, how we can solve this problem, this enigma? How can I solve it? What I shall do? There should be some extra effort. What I can do to find the two dip? Who can answer? So let's assume I did, I have taken some shot. My geophones are parallel to this orientation. These are the geophones planted parallel to the pen where the pen is. Whereas the deep direction, as you can see. So what shall I do to determine whether there is a dip or not? Any volunteers? Any idea? What do you think? It's called good grades in the quiz. Yes. Sir. yes. I, I think use use, use more than one line. line. Perfect. Yes, Zoena. That's we use more than one line. So that's one. Oops. Another should be perpendicular to it. I'm Zayana. Zayana, sorry. Zayana. So that's that's the right answer. Yeah, we need two different shots. There are two different shots. Perpendicular. Always perpendicular. To what, whatever orientation you make, you need to make another line. Another forward and reverse shots. Perpendicular to the first line then you can determine whether there is a dipping or not. And that's how you determine the true dip. And that's how uh, uh, this equation explains. So this diagram, what you see this diagram here, it's a bit complicated. That's exactly how I was explaining the things here. So to find the two dips, so as Zayana said, we need two different shots. Let's, that's one first line. This gives me one dip. This give me one dip. That's give, this will give me one dip. I call it, uh, is my mouse? I call it A1 or alpha one. This gives me one dip. I make another line perpendicular to the first line. This will give me another dip. And the dip I obtained from here is simply what? Alpha 2. So how I get these dips? How I get alpha 1? You get it basically from intercepts. Each intercepts give you uh, a thickness, an edge. This will give you another edge. So you work out from these edges, you work out what's the dip. And there is a margin of error because these dips are not vertical dips. 
there are stratigraphic dips. The line is perpendicular to the interface. H is the line perpendicular to the interface. So each one gives you an alpha, alpha 1, alpha 2. To get the true dip, we use this equation. The equation you see in the slide. That's the true dip. We obtain two different dips from uh, two different lines perpendicular to each other. Each line has a forward and reverse shot. So we calculate the two dip. And we are still missing something, very important thing. What is that? Azimuth. So where this dip is? I just calculated the amount of dip. Is it dipping like that? Or what orientation is it? What's the azimuth? If I assume this is the north, exactly. If this is dipping like that to the north, that has an azimuth zero. The azimuth theta is zero if the layer is dipping to the north. If it's dipping to the west, the, the azimuth is going to be 90, and so on. So how I can determine this azimuth? I use the second equation you see here. So let's take this, uh, this example. That's, uh, let's take this example. Right now, the azimuth is 270. It's dipping to the west, assuming that this is the north. East, west, and uh, toward me is the south. So it's dipping to the west. The dip, uh, the azimuth uh, is 270. And I made two different lines. Let me take another pen, red probably, that's a red. And this is a black. So I assume that the the dip I obtained from here, first one is alpha one. So what I know about this one, I know already because I made this line, I know its orientation. I know its orientation, what orientation it has with respect to the north. It, let's assume this has, uh, let's make it small, 45. It has 45 azimuth to the north. It has 45 to the north. And I'm trying to find the true dip. Trying to find the true dip. The true dip can be found, you either use alpha 1 or alpha 2. So here I'm using alpha 1. I know that the alpha 1 has an orientation of 45 to the north, an angle of 45 to the north. That's the north. And this is oriented at some angle which is 45, like that, on the surface. That's north, this is 45, 90, 180, and so on. So it's oriented something like that, 45. And I get some theta. Using this equation, I get some theta. So this theta is the angle between the true dip and 45. This theta, the one you get, is the angle between the angle between this one, alpha one or line one, and the two dip. To get the two dip, then just add the theta you get from here to uh, the orientation of this one, the orientation of line one. Whatever theta you get, whatever azimuth you get from here, add it to the orientation of line one. How much was the orientation of line one? I hope things are, are, are very clear to you. Uh, uh, maybe I give you some example. You work out the example because uh, a similar question came to some exam, I believe, in the last three, one of the years I taught this course. So going forward, let's discuss what are the caveats? What are the problems? with geophysical refraction techniques. Why it's not common as seismic reflection technique? Why it's not used in oil industry? Why its applications are limited compared to seismic reflection technique? One of the most 
important things that make seismic refraction techniques a bit useless is that what we call velocity inversion. Velocity inversion happens whenever we encounter a deeper layer of a lower velocity than a shallower layer. A layer which is deeper have a lower velocity than an upper layer. Because according to this equation, if this one is larger, V1 is larger, V2 is smaller, we get a larger number here, smaller number here, overall smaller number here, larger number here, and the minus, the minus sign will mix the statement below this square, square root a negative. The parameter you get, the value you get below that, the square root going to be negative. And if it's negative, there is no solution. You cannot solve this equation. You cannot find the value of H. So it cannot be solved. And that's happened whenever we encounter a deeper layer of a lower velocity than a shallower layer. So that's one of the most problematic things. We need what? Uh, we, we need velocity to be increasing as we move deeper, and which is not always true. Another important, another problems, important problems we encounter in seismic refraction technique, whenever there is a thin layer, we might not be able to detect. However, this is very common also to seismic reflection technique. A small layer might not be detected, either in seismic reflection or refraction. We'll discuss the case, at least here for seismic refraction. During seismic reflection technique, the other chapter, the next chapter, we'll discuss why thin layers cannot be detected. What is seismic resolution? How, what is the smallest thickness of a layer you can detect? You can separate. Human, high, human eyes even cannot detect very, very small. I cannot see bacteria, I cannot see viruses. So it's likewise for geophysics or geophysical technique or what we call seismic technique in general. At a certain depth, we cannot detect what is the separation. We cannot detect two different layers. And uh, to find the true velocity, to find the true depth, we also need to have multiple, multiple shot directions. This is not considered, um, I mean, a geologic drawback, but yeah, it makes a little bit your survey more complex, more costly. Uh, there is a question, um, use many geophones with, uh, you, yeah, sorry, that's not a question, that was an answer, thanks for the answer. Yes, online the geophones differently, that's all right. So, yes, we need to, as, the, uh, as some of you are already answering, we need to have multiple orientations. At least the minimum number is two different lines, orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. And that's also related to the last drawback, which is what we get from one line is apparent. It's not the true dip. True dip can be obtained if we have two different lines, orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. So let's discuss some of these drawbacks, the most common drawbacks. One of them is hidden layer, and the other one is low velocity layer. Why we get a hidden layer and why we get uh, also low velocity layer. The first thing we start with low velocity because this is very easy to explain. So in case of a layer, layer two having a velocity lower than, the velocity of layer two is lower than the velocity of layer one and layer two. What happens to the ray path? According to Snell's law, the ray will deflect toward the normal, not away from the normal, toward the normal. So the angle of refraction is lower than the angle of incident. 
For this reason, we never get critical. There is no critical. There are refractions, but not critical. This is a refraction. However, it's not a critical refraction. We need critical refraction. We need the energy to be traveling parallel to the interface to create to, for us what we call headwaves. And the waves are generated based on what we call Huygens principle. So in such cases, what happens basically, what we see, that's the real geology. This is the real geology. But geophysical data based on our picking, first arrival picking, we see only two layers. One is direct, the energy traveling exactly from here to the geophones. That's the direct. The other one is the refraction from second interface, not interface, not first interface, but second interface. I don't get the refractions from first interface. I don't get the refraction. There is no critical energy at this interface. The energy only appears from the second interface. So what I see, what are the my interpretation going to be depending only on refraction data. I get two layers. And also, the thickness to the third layer is larger. There are two layers. I get only two layers. That's first layer. That's, I assume it's one over V2. This is direct one over V1. So I'm missing one of the layers. I'm missing the second layer. The velocity, the velocity you get here is velocity from actually from the third layer. So depth to the third layer will be will be exaggerated. You get a larger depth. You think that's all the thickness of the first layer, omitting the second layer which is a big drawback, especially if the velocity of the second layer is low. And that happens quite often. For example, if you are trying to find water table and the upper layer is really a larger rock, uh, sorry, a rock which a higher velocity, a denser rock, let's assume, for example, igneous rock on top of sedimentary rocks, we know water can be contained only in sedimentary rocks cannot be contained in igneous or metamorphic rock because the porosity is very low in uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks. We cannot find the water table. We miss whole layer two, which is a sedimentary layer having a lower velocity than the igneous layer above. So that's one of the drawbacks and that happens for many reasons. As I said, sandstone below uh, limestone, limestone have a higher velocity, sedimentary rocks below igneous rocks. And how we can find out, how we can make sure that there is a problem in our geophysical interpretation or not, we can use other geological data. The most important geological or geophysical data are borders, logs. They can tell you something about the velocity trends. Is there, for example, an igneous layer above a sedimentary layer? Or what exactly is the geologic section in that area? And the uh, geologic sections, if you find some outcrop, geologic map made by, for example, geologists. Geologists, they take a course called field mapping technique. From, field, from their um, visits to the field, they can guess what is the dipping of the layers, what is the structure of the layers? Is there a deeper or is there an igneous rock above a sedimentary rock or not? Based on field mapping techniques they use. So this is one of the problems, low velocity layers. And the other first problem we talked about is hidden layer. Hidden layers happens whenever the layer thickness is very low. Layer thickness is low, then seismic cannot resolve it. It happens for both seismic refraction and seismic reflection. And why is that? 
Why these things happen? It happens because the layer is very thin and the velocity, the velocity is increasing with it. The first layer has a higher, uh, lower velocity than second layer. Second layer has a lower velocity than third layer. So the velocity is increasing. However, this is very thin. The sandwich layer, the layer two, which is between layer one and layer two, is very thin, small. So the ray, the critical refraction from third layer is faster. It goes faster than the critical in the second layer. So if this is very thin, it might easily, the energy from the third layer can easily overcome, can easily come earlier than the energy from second layer. So I don't see a refraction from, from second layer. That's the simplest interpretation. So the energy, for example, this is um, in here. Velocity is increasing. So velocity of second layer is higher than the velocity of first, first layer. Velocity of third layer is as well higher than the velocity of second layer. But what happens? Critical refractions from second layers, they arrive later than critical refractions from third layer. They arrive earlier than the one from here, because the velocity here is much larger. It travels earlier. I cannot distinguish them. So this is the refraction from this line is arriving after the refraction, critical refraction from third layer. This is here. Whereas this is from here. So I don't, I miss. It's happening, but I cannot see it because the assumption is that a refraction is the fastest after crossover. Refraction, crossover one, crossover two. Refraction we know is the fastest after crossover. When I do picking, first arrival picking, that's the first Jufun. That's the second Jufu, for example. Third one. And so on. I miss this one. Here the energy arrives. You can't solve it. Yeah, actually, it can't be solved. There is some limitation. Any study. Yeah. What you can do, you maybe use, you might use seismic reflection technique then probably you can't solve it if the layer is thin is very thin it's not as bad as the first case where the velocity some layer deeper layer has a lower velocity because maybe if the layer is very thin i'm not i might not be interested on the lab the, the, that specific layer whether i'm talking about seismic exploration or mining industry if the layer is very thin Mm, why should I waste my time exploring? It's already very thin. I'm not interested in it. it. Cannot contain a lot of oil or a lot of water or a lot of any other ore body. It's not a big problem, but uh, it cannot be solved directly using seismic. That's one of the drawback. That's what we call a drawback in seismic refraction technique. Or even it's in seismic reflection technique but it's not so severe, actually. You know, once we discuss seismic, we can improve seismic reflection data in somehow. And that improvement cannot be applicable to seismic refraction technique. So hidden layer, there is a hidden layer, if it's very thin. How thin? It depends. What is the velocity of uh, third layer? Is it so high or not so high? If it's so high, even probably a bit large layer, a large layer two might be hidden. Because the refraction from the third layer, they might happen earlier than the refract critical refraction from the second layer. The critical refraction from third layer might happen the earlier than the critical refraction from second layer. So I miss the first arrivals from second layer. 
So that's one of the drawback. Another drawback, it's not a big drawback, it's a drawback in any other application, not necessarily in geophysical applications, but other applications as well. Is you sampling, how you space your geophones. If you space them close to each other, you might increase the resolution of your data. If you space them farther away from each other, you might miss or might omit one of the layers. So let's assume that these are the number of layers, one, two, three, four, I have four layers. I get direct and three different refractions. I get three different refractions, direct and three different refractions. Let's simplify. And uh, that's how I get the energy. That's first geophone. The energy arrives like that. Scar, no energy arrived. That's the direct started arriving. That's the second one. And so on. So there is an energy. I go pick the first breaks. I pick the energy which arrives after the trace being calm. There is no movement in the trace, that's how I detect the first arrival. So if I space the Jufuns farther away, for any reason, maybe I don't have a lot of Jufuns, maybe I cannot plant a Jufun somewhere here in this area, maybe there is um, some road there, I cannot put my Jufuns, so I space the Jufuns farther away. What happens? For this specific case, I got only two layers. I get two layers because that's how I make the interpretation. I go pick the first energy. I miss, I miss some of the layers. This is not a big issue because it can be solved during the field acquisition. It's not a geologic reason behind this problem. Whereas it's the way we deployed our technique. And everything, if we don't sample it correctly, we might not get good resolution. For drilling, the, bit, the more wills you dr drill, the better you can delineate the subsurface. A better image of the subsurface you, you will obtain. The same story is equally true for geophysical analysis. It's also true for seismic reflection or any other geophysical technique or even geological. If you take few samples from the field, getting some samples of rock, trying to investigate what is the rock typing, if you take few samples, you might misinterpret your results. The same is true for geophysical investigation. In general, so in geophysical technique, especially in seismic refraction technique, uh, we are not interested usually, uh, especially for oil application, we are not interested on topmost layer. That's in Oman, for example, where oil is located, oil fields are located. Most of the areas are, the upper layer is sandy. It's made of sand. It's very low velocity, very, very low. It's unconsolidated, unconsolidated layer. So we need to get rid of it. Uh, we'll come to you, the question. So uh, we need to remove this layer. And the way to remove it is using seismic refraction. There is a process in seismic reflection called static correction. You cannot do static correction, remove the first, the travel time takes huge time for the ray to travel in low velocity layer. So to remove these static problems, we use seismic refraction technique. So these are the few lines explaining why we use seismic refraction in oil industry. Even in oil industry, we need seismic refraction. You can either use wheel locks 
that's very expensive, or use seismic refraction, which is very cheap. Seismic refraction has wide application in such cases. In such cases, because the topmost layer is very slow layer in terms of velocity, the travel time is large, it takes huge time for the energy to travel in very slow layers. So we can easily detect these layers, their thicknesses, their velocities, and can deal with it, remove it from whenever, whenever we are doing processing for seismic reflection in oil industry. That's what whatever I have been explaining is not related, by the way, to what image you see here. The images are due to what we call insufficient number of geophones. And that, again, will add a lot of cost to your survey, as Aisha mentioned in the, in the comments. Yes. You need to bring a lot of geophones. How much geophones? How much smaller I make it? It depends on your applications. Whatever, are you interested to go very deep? Um, what do you think is the maximum depth you are trying to investigate? What do you think is the minimum thickness of layers are there? Back again to what we were discussing in the first lecture, it's very important to bring some conceptual model, a model you think is possible for the Earth. And we keep updating this model. So someone has a question? Yes, Abdullah. You have a question, Abdullah? Me, how I can mute this? Sorry. Uh, let's move forward. What about a fourth, what do you think about fourth? How the data will look like, seismic refraction data, if the subsurface has a fault. This is a normal fault. That's uh, the hanging wall. This is the foot wall, foot wall. Hanging wall. What do you think, how they look like? That's how they look like. This is the direct energy. So this is the direct energy, the energy traveling straight from source to any receiver. I get two different segments. I get two different segments, one, two. And my question, what is the relationship between these two segments? Same, the, hmm? same velocity. They have the same velocity. If they have the same velocity, it means they are parallel. Their slope is the same because they are traveling in the same layer. Same slope, that's true. So that's how we usually detect some offsets. So in your data, that's how it appears. The data is, this is the interpretation, your modeling, your processing, However, the data are simply some traces. That's first trace, that's another trace, and so on. This is another trace, that's one other trace. Let's make it simple, very quick. So what you see, you will find that there is one line, another line, and you might think that this is a third layer. And this, this is totally wrong. It means that there is a layer of a lower velocity than this layer, which is, which is not possible in seismic refraction technique. That's actually an offset. I, I should not connect it like that. This is an offset. It was part of some questions in um, some exams, I believe, or quizzes uh, in previous years. So what we will see whenever there is an offset or a fault, 
I see two different segments. That's one segment, another segment, and there is an offset between them. It seems if you connect them, you connect them, you think that there is a lower velocity in between, which is not true, which is not possible according to a refraction law. So that's actually an offset. What if we want to know if there is a layer of a lower velocity or a higher velocity? Let's say that this is, uh, this is some applications. Let's say that this is an igneous body. That's an igneous body came to the surface, later got eroded, and another layer got deposited. So I got one layer, that's the first layer, which is the same layer, was eroded by an igneous body, then, sorry, intruded, not eroded, intruded by igneous body, and later got eroded, that's the erosional surface. Then a deposition of another layer happened. So I'm interested to know how thick is this one? What is the aerial extent of this body? What I can simplest technique is what we call fan shooting. Fan shooting shoot or make a lot of source and receiver pairs covering this area. If this is an igneous rock, uh, this is a sedimentary rock, that's the host rock, this is the body rock or target rock, that's our interest, that's the layer or rock body we try to find. So the velocity of igneous rock usually is larger than the velocity of sedimentary rock. If I make a lot of pair of shot and receiver, so my shot location is the same. I keep moving only one. I have only one receiver. Let's assume it's one or receiver. One, two, three, four. I keep moving it. What I will observe here, pick only, I pick the refraction time, one of the refraction. So this have a slower time. This has a slower time. This also has slower time. And the time here in these segments becomes different, totally different. So the time here, because it's the same layer, let's assume the time is one, one becomes two, 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 it's faster time. It's just a number, random number. One again, one, one. So I'm already seeing that there is an anomaly in travel times. This tree has different times than the remaining. So what shall I do? I shall highlight them. Make some crossing. I believe in between, from here to here, there is something. Where is it? Is it here? I don't know. But there might be something. What shall I do? I made some source and receivers. That's the first source. I haven't changed the location of the source. I make another fan. Another fan shooting. Another or uh, change the location of the source. That's the second source. So for this one, this is the first one. One, one. Two, 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 again, one, one, one. There is some anomaly here. This three has some anomaly. There could be anything in this path that changed, that let the travel time becomes, the velocity becomes larger. The velocity here is larger. The travel time here is slower. Uh, shorter, sorry. The travel time is shorter, whereas the travel time here is larger. Because in low velocity, the energy takes longer time to arrive. And they made the same thing here. This is still one, 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 two, 
two, two, one, one. So I cover this area. I cover here. So what is the intersection? That's the intersection. Here, here. So I think there could be something, let me use another color probably. Make it this color. So I think there could be something in this area. A something of a larger velocity, a higher velocity. How I can better delineate it? How I can make more constraint? How I can make more make it better resolved? The question is how I can make this body better resolved to find better its aerial coverage. Sub two. What shall I do? What can be done to make hmm? use more source, another source? Yes, S3. another S3, probably S4, and so on. Yeah, that's true. We add other sources. This thing is called tomography. In geophysics, that's called tomography. This is exactly the same if you go to a, a hospital and take an image of your brain. They send a lot of energy to your brain. It's a lot from every direction. If there is, la Allah, if there is, for example, jalta, a rock probably or something, a blood is packed together, the, the velocity gonna be the energy travels faster or it diffract a lot, it returns back, it cannot go through it. So they can easily tell if there is something, something bad in your brain or in your body. That's the same concept. That's what we call an anomaly. But instead of looking to small things, we look to the whole earth. And that's how they determine, for example, if I take a line, a cross line from Egypt, this is Egypt, that's Turkey, that's image, which is, uh, um, I mean, made uh, horizontal, probably. That's Palestine, this is Sina. These are the travel times. What image you see, the color here is a travel time. So beneath Turkey, what I see, uh, a, I see a lower velocity. That's a lower velocity based on this color. This is a higher velocity. So what's happening? It's lower velocity, that's, this is higher velocity. What's happening exactly? This is a subduction zone. Oceanic crust, that's an oceanic crust, which is usually thicker, denser, heavier, Oceanic crust is ovulite, it's igneous rocks usually. So it's dipping beneath Turkey. It's dipping beneath Turkey. And how they made this image? They used a lot of earthquake data, a lot. One earthquake, that's, that's the source. This is the earthquake source. They have seismic stations everywhere on the Earth's surface. They have stations everywhere, so they can tell how the energy travels, how much time it takes for the energy to arrive. It's almost like a tomograph. You are building a tomographic model of the Earth. And my question, what happens if there is a collision between two different plates. An oceanic plate is moving beneath a continental plate. What do you think will happen on that location, on that area? 
جو فيزيكالي وات وي ويل اوبزيرف وات تركي سافرد الوت فروم ثرو ذير هيستوري earthquakes earthquakes yeah two plates are colliding that's true turkey suffered a lot from earthquakes and that same is true about japan pacific plate is moving beneath the asian plate there is a trench in japan that, that, that's for the same reason japan suffers a lot from earthquakes So Turkey is suffering from earthquakes. And this is, this is exactly telling me, oh, this is an oceanic crust moving beneath a continental crust, which has a lower velocity. This is an oceanic crust moving beneath a continental crust. Those data or those tomographic image, this is a tomographic image, are obtained using a lot of data, a lot of GeoFoon source pairs. Yeah. The source in this case, at least for the Earth, Earth data, Earth imaging for the Earth, we cannot use a hammer, we cannot also use a vibrator, we need some source of very large energy, which are basically earthquakes. So I have this image, uh, let me try to stop because This is here. I want you to hear uh, also. Um, I share with you a top uh, media. So, do you see this one? That's exactly what happens. CT scans produce 3D images of the inside of the human body. The instrument uses an energy source that emits. Is there a voice too? Do you? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Good, good. That's good. That's the reason I played it on a top. A fan shaped beam of X rays and a receiver or X ray detector on the exit side of the patient that records a snapshot X ray. Multiple snapshots collected during one complete rotation are sent to a computer to create a cross-sectional image or slice of the body. Between rotations, the body is moved through the machine in increments with an image slice being... This is the same principle. We have source and a lot of receivers. Similar to fan shooting. Computed at each position. Every rotation, here speeded up, yields an image of a new slice as it moves through the length of the target. In this case, through the head of the person who is lying in the chamber. How simple seismology would be if we could do a CAT scan of our planet. But X-rays cannot penetrate the Earth. So how do we know what's inside? By using seismometers as receivers and earthquakes as the energy source, seismologists look at the Earth in a similar fashion. By using the arrival times from worldwide Earth, seismologists look at the... What? My question, what is the red energy and what's the blue energy? First of all, what's the red energy? B wave. That's true. What's the blue energy? S wave. Of course, S wave. Of course, S wave. The Earth in a similar fashion. See how they shake the hole. Earth in a similar fashion. The S wave is moving like that. It moves the home up and down. That's the particle motion direction. It moves parallel to the propagation direction. Whereas the S wave moves side to side, perpendicular to the propagation direction. So if I play it again. Seismologists look at the earth in a similar fashion. Up, down, side, side. By using the arrival times from worldwide earthquakes, seismologists were able to define layers in the Earth. Later, they expanded the method to look at smaller areas. Let's look at how this is done by using a highly simplified model of a uniform crust. For simplicity, we will use straight line ray paths so the seismic waves won't get deflected and bent by different layers as they do in reality. 
An evenly spaced grid of seismometers records earthquake arrival times. Seismic waves travel through different materials at different speeds. By measuring the time it takes seismic waves to travel from an earthquake to different seismic stations, scientists deduce velocity variations within the Earth. Later so this is similar to fast shooting. I found that there is something different. The velocity here is different than the velocity from the remaining. That's one S, another source. The sources are earthquakes. Arrival times for the slower ray paths in the shaded red area indicate slowing has occurred somewhere along the way. We won't actually know where the slowing has occurred until the data have been analyzed. By using what we know about how seismic waves travel through different materials, we can infer what the structure might look like. What does this tell us geologically? What are these anomalies? Well, they could be regions that have different compositions, temperatures, or fluid contents, including water, steam, or magma. In order to know which, seismologists work with other Earth scientists, such as geologists and geochemists, to combine independent observation to solve ambiguities. So that's uh, that's it for today, because we we are remaining only you know, with five minutes. We stop here. There are a bit more slides, two more slides in seismic refraction chapter that will continue next time. Um, for now, if you have any questions to what have been covered, please don't be shy to ask. Doctor, I have a question, please. Yeah, go ahead, Ali. Uh, Doctor, uh, in the low velocity layers, <clears throat> the first layers, uh, we don't have any reflection signal. Otherwise, uh, in the second layers, we have reflection and refraction. What are the reasons? The reason because the energy deflects toward the normal. So it's all, the velocity is lower in the second layer. If I go back to my slides, let me stop. And instead share all the slides. So that's, that's the case, that's what you see. The energy is deflecting toward the normal in all the cases where it's happening here, here, it always goes down until it reaches to the, what we think is the crossover distance or critical distance. Once it reaches the critical distance, it will appear as well uh, as a refraction. At a refraction, it moved already toward the normal. That's the, let's assume this is the critical, could be the critical, there is no critical angle. There is no, technically there is no critical angle. But if we make the assumption that this is a critical angle, I get reflections. After this angle, after actually the critical, most of the energy is a reflection. So, for such cases, there is no critical refraction. There is reflection. Definitely, there is a reflection. We get reflections. We don't get only energy that's traveling parallel to this interface. Critical refraction. That's what we miss. That's what we cannot detect. Or not because we cannot detect, it will not be generated at all. Hope I'm answering your question. Yes, Doctor, thank you. I get it now. Good. Any further questions? Four more minutes. Do you have any questions to what have been covered? A few more slides. Uh, the, the last few slides are, are about how to do seismic survey. What's the simple configurations? Or what are the techniques? how to lie down the geophones, what is the minimum number of geophones. And following this, this week there is no, uh, there is no feed, we cannot do feed. Maybe then week uh, six we'll have a feed. We'll do a feed or based on seismic refraction technique. Any further questions? If you don't have questions, I stop the recording and say goodbye.
I'm stopping the recording.